a message to Mary, who will then let me know your question. She'll read it out, and then I'll make the answer. So you don't have to wait to the end. You can, you know, this is, we can, you can interrupt me and ask while we're, I'm proceeding. I'll be happy to entertain your questions. Okay, so I'm going to put a, us on. And so I'm going to be talking about the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, it ends its mission. Um, uh, it ended it, it, well, they said officially January 31st of, of this year. Uh, it was uh, operational for 16 years. Uh, during the first nine years, all of its instruments were operational. Um, because some of its instruments, uh, instruments had to be cooled with liquid helium, um, and that ran out uh, after nine years. But it, other instruments were um, still running, and they ended the mission uh, this year. Uh, and it's one of the big four telescopes. I just wanted to mention who the telescope's named after. It's named after uh, Lyman Spitzer, who was the uh, Denise Applewhite Professor of Astrophysics at Princeton University. Um, Dr. Uh, Spitzer um, lived from 1914 to 1997, so he really didn't see this telescope. It was named in his honor after he passed away. Um, but he um, made major contributions to stellar dynamics, plasma physics, thermal nuclear fusion, and space uh, astronomy. And he came up with the idea in 1946, even before we had satellites in space, that what we really need is a telescope in space. Uh, we ended up having four, and we'll talk a little bit about what the four differences were, but it was his brilliant idea. Um, the, uh, one of the most famous, of course, is the Hubble, um, which was his initial idea of using an optical telescope that which sees uh, light, um, visible light. Uh, the telescope named after him sees infrared, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so the, the Spitzer Space Telescope ends its mission. Uh, I remember when it started um, in, in 2003 and it ended it officially, uh, even though I think some other pictures might have been released, but it ended it at 5.30 p.m. on January 30th of this year. Uh, it was launched in 2013 and it was one of the four great telescopes that were uh, launched. It, the one we know most about, of course, is the Hubble. Uh, but then there's the Shander X-ray Observatory and the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, uh, and they and with the Spitzer they uh, were able to observe the uh, universe at major differences in light, and we'll talk about that. And these demonstrate the power, uh, power of using different wavelengths of light to create a, a much fuller and complete picture of our fantastic universe. Um, so the universe is not just radiating visible light, which is what we detect with our eyes in which um, most uh, telescopes initially used optical visible light. Um, the problem is that our atmosphere, which does protect us from the sun, also keeps a lot of the uh, different wavelengths of lights out. And the only way to see that is to put a telescope into space. I'd like to show a little video um, that I uh, hopefully it you won't, uh, some of you might some know some of this stuff, but it talks about infrared light versus visible light. Does everyone hear this? These days we're all familiar with night vision cameras, but how do these things work? How is it that you can just turn on this camera and see the invisible? Another use of night vision cameras that you might not be familiar with is their ability to see through smoke and dust. Fire departments commonly use cameras like these to find people trapped in smoky rooms or to pinpoint the exact location of forest fires through clouds of smoke. So how do these things actually work? What are we really seeing when we look inside a night vision camera? Well, it may surprise you to learn that everything in the universe emits some kind of light. It's just not the kind of light we're used to thinking about. The sun, for example, our star, emits visible light. That's why our eyes evolved to detect that kind of light. But that's not the whole story. I'm sure you're familiar with all the different kinds of visible light, all the colors from violet to red. But there are actually lots of other kinds of light that our eyes aren't sensitive to. 
The reason all the colors of light are different is that they have different energies. And what you see here is that the light has different wavelengths. The blue light, for example, has a higher energy, so it has a shorter wavelength. The red light, on the other hand, has less energy, so it has a longer wavelength. But that's just the light we can see with our eyes. That's not all there is. The shortest wavelength light are gamma rays, which can have wavelengths smaller than an atom. The longest wavelengths are radio waves, which can have wavelengths larger than the entire Mary, Earth. I see your picture in my display, not me. The kind of light an object emits depends... Whoops. Sorry, folks, let me go back. What's going on? Oh, sorry. Mary, as I interrupt, I am seeing your picture in the, um, in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, as the speaker, not me. All the colors from violet to red. But there are actually lots of other kinds of light that our eyes aren't sensitive to. The reason all the colors of light are different is that they have different energies. And what you see here is that the light has different wavelengths. The blue light, for example, has a higher energy, so it has a shorter wavelength. The red light, on the other hand, has less energy, so it has a longer wavelength. But that's just the light we can see with our eyes. That's not all there is. The shortest wavelength light are gamma rays, which can have wavelengths smaller than an atom. The longest wavelengths are radio waves, which can have wavelengths larger than the entire Earth. The kind of light an object emits depends on its temperature. We're used to thinking of something hot giving off light, but it might surprise you to learn that objects that are cooler, like myself, give off a kind of light too, and that's what a night vision camera can pick up. That sort of light is called infrared light. The world sure looks a lot different in infrared light. Remember that what you're actually seeing is temperature. So something that's warm is going to look bright in the infrared. And something that's cold looks dark. Ice cream. Blow dryer. And infrared radiation is actually a measurement of temperature. Places on my face that are cold, like my nose, appear dark in an infrared camera because they're giving off less infrared radiation. And places that are warm, like my mouth, or the hair next to my head, are brighter because they're warmer. You can even see my breath and my nose if you look carefully. And this is an ice cube. And humans, of course, are not the only things that emit infrared light. What do you think you can learn about animals by observing them in the infrared? What about reptiles? Remember, they're cold-blooded. Giraffes. Here's a Nubian ibex. What do you think horns look like in the infrared? Can you even see a gorilla in this picture? If you look carefully, you'll notice you can still see the zebra's stripes, even in the infrared. How about elephants? What about a polar bear? How about a rhinoceros? Check out the horns. A cat, notice the infrared footprints. Deer in the dark. A helicopter, notice the plume of heat from the engine. Earth movers with hot smokestacks. A car engine turning on and heating up. Infrared light also has a lot of really interesting properties that visible light doesn't have. For example, it can often pass through things that block visible light entirely. I have a black plastic bag, and as you'll notice, you can't see through it at all. But with an infrared camera, there's no problem. But just like infrared light can penetrate some things that stop visible light, it also gets stopped by some things that let visible light through. For example, here's a piece of glass. And as you can see, 
Now the infrared gets through it all. If you haven't guessed, that's how the greenhouse effect works. Infrared light can't get through gases like water vapor in our atmosphere, which means that the heat is trapped and our planet is getting warmer. So what am I, an astronomer, doing with an infrared camera? Well, if everyday objects look different through an infrared camera, you can bet objects in space do too. For example, here's an image of the constellation Orion, which you're probably familiar with from the night sky. But now, let's look at it through an infrared camera. Look how much you're missing. Astronomers are also hoping to use infrared light to find planets around other stars. Planets don't give off any visible light of their own, making them nearly impossible to see close to a bright star. But in the infrared, planets give off their own light, making them much easier to find. Astronomers will soon be able to use very sensitive infrared cameras on a new space telescope, the Space Infrared Telescope Facility. And it should give us a whole new perspective on the universe. At that point, we'll finally be getting a more complete view of the universe. Right now, we don't even know what we're going to discover. There are so many wonders out there. We'll finally be able to see more than our eyes can see. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the problems with our atmosphere and one of its advantages is that it does protect us from getting light that really can damage us like gamma rays, uh, uh, X-rays, and ultraviolet light, um, and that is blocked by our atmosphere. Um, and the window that we can see is mainly in the optical regime and also in radio waves. And so you notice that most ground-based stations are either optical, and since 1950s, uh, we've used radio telescopes to view the sky. Everything else, we would have to go out into space. And that is the reason for the four giant telescopes that we came out with. So again, uh, atmosphere is opaque to, um, to the uh, light in the ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. Uh, it's transparent to optical, but still does some damage. Uh, and it's transparent to the radio waves. So the atmosphere does not allow all light through and nearly all gamma rays, X-rays and ultraviolet and infrared are blocked. Uh, by our atmosphere, which probably is good for us because that's how we survived. And a large range of radiation waves is, is unblocked. Uh, and to re give you a, a history, um, so the wavelength of light, the longest wavelength light, as mentioned in that film, is radio waves. Uh, then the next shorter wavelength is microwaves, then infrared. And this narrow band over here is what our detectors, our eyes, uh, can see, uh, and then shorter than that is the ultraviolet light, and then shorter X-rays, and the shortest wavelength of, of uh, light is the gamma rays. Okay, again, another picture of this showing that we see really a very small portion of the uh, uh, light spectrum with our, our eyes. So <clears throat> uh, we've put up space telescopes to get above our atmosphere, which um, and so the four telescopes are the Hubble Space Telescope, which actually covers a, a range of ultraviolet, visible, and infrared. And um, by the way, the Hubble has celebrated 26 years of existence. It was originally designed to last the best 10, uh, but we've had some really great engineers at, um, at NASA and that telescope is still operational. Uh, the Shander, was put up to look at X-rays. Uh, the Spitzer, which was renamed uh, to be the Spitzer Telescope, is for uh, infrared, and we're going to talk about that one tonight. Uh, and then for gamma rays, is there's the Fermi Telescope. Uh, you, this is a famous picture of the Hubble. Uh, here's a picture of the Shander X-ray Observatory. Uh, this is the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope. And this is the one we'll talk about tonight, which is an artist uh, rendition of the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, just to give you an idea of when we look into 
the universe with different wavelengths. If we look at visible, this is what the sky looks like. And this is a two-dimensional picture of looking around at the opening of the whole universe. Uh, if we looked at the universe with radio waves, this is where we would what we would see. Uh, if we looked at infrared, whoops. If we, man, I, I can't use my mouse because it, uh, anyway, so if you look at infrared, which is C, uh, this is way the, what the universe would look like. Uh, if we looked at the universe in X-rays, uh, which is D, you can see a lot more objects out there. So there's a lot of high energy uh, radiation coming out. And if we looked at the universe in gamma rays, we again see that most of it is at the equator. So most of the light that we're seeing is coming from our galaxy, um, but, we see a, a lot of very high energy light coming out of, of our galaxy. So infrared light measures the temperature of an object. The hotter the object, the more light the object emits. And infrared pictures are colorized since we really can't see infrared light. Okay, so we're gonna, that's a lot of the pictures will be colorized. So many of the universe's messages are transmitted in thermal infrared light, which are sky heavily filters. So. We are the, we're fortunate that we have been able to see this. So in space, any object that has a temperature above zero, absolute zero, which happens to be minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 273 degrees Celsius, radiates light. And that light, will, which we, the easiest would be detected as infrared. And the NASA Spitzer Space Telescope builds on a science scientific and technical foundations established by two previous space infrared satellites. So there were two other satellites launched before this great telescope was launched. The two other ones were the infrared uh, uh, astronomical satellite IRIS, which was launched in 1983, and it conducted the first survey of the skies at thermal infrared wavelengths. The next one was launched in 1995. This is the Infrared Space Observatory, and this employed cryogenic uh, weighs a measure with a 60 centimeter, um, that's about an eight inch uh, diameter telescope and the first infrared detectors in space, okay? And the reason you wanted to have it cold and they used liquid uh, helium, which has a temperature of four degrees above absolute zero. So it's about 450 degrees below uh, zero on the Fahrenheit scale, uh, is that you want to be able to observe objects in space that are cold. And these missions demonstrated the fundamentals of cryogenic technology and considerable scientific benefit of liquid helium cooled telescopes and instruments in space. Okay, uh, so infrared astronomy want to catch a glimpse of an otherwise hidden infrared universe and infrared astronomy, which culminates with the NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, the most sensitive infrared telescope observatory ever launched, okay? Uh, by the way, the cost of this puppy was roughly $2.2 billion. I don't know if we would get it through Congress today. Um, the uh, ongoing advances in technology of infrared detectors coupled with innovative choices in orbit and the design of cryogenic systems have maintained the scientific vitality of the telescope at roughly one third the original cost that has missed. Okay, <clears throat> so as most a lot of projects like the um, James Webb, which is supposed to be launched in 2021, has major cost overruns. This telescope came in at one third of the original estimated cost, and major innovations that they put into place with this telescope was new infrared uh, detector developments. They had a clever choice of an orbit. They used for the first time made a lot of store and dump telem telemetry and they used um, sophisticated project management. And I'll go through some of these details of how to run a project in a good way. Okay, so the infrared detector development, Spitzer's redesign benefited greatly from the dramatic technology developments made in infrared detectors and lightweight uh, uh, optics. Key in space, of course, is every pound that you send in space costs you many, many bucks. So you wanna keep it down. Uh, in a span of 15 years, infrared astronomers went from using a handful of individual detector 
pixels to uh, routinely working with large format arrays of many thousands of pixels. So even though if you looked at uh, detectors for visible light, which like the Hubble is what, 18 billion pixels, uh, the, um, this is not close to it, but compared to uh, other infrared detectors, is this, uh, with six, uh, the Spitzer has 65,000 um, pixels of detection. It is quite a sophisticated uh, object. And the groundbreaking infrared satellites relied on detectors with only 62 pixels. By the way, um, <clears throat> I can remember my first uh, digital camera had 4,000 pixels. And I said, wow. Um, whereas uh, Spitzer's infrared uses over 65,000 pixels per detector, which are considered small by modern standards. The Spitzer redesign, uh, this is their choice of orbit, uh, managed to cut costs by placing the observatory in an Earth trailing orbit. So it, it, it's in orbit around the sun, but it's in, it's, it follows the Earth. It's sort of like a, um, a, a satellite that's following around with the Earth. By the way, they recently found that we have objects that are going around the sun with the Earth uh, in an orbit of the Earth. And so it drifts away from us about one-tenth of an astronomical unit per year. Remember, one astronomical unit is uh, the distance from the Earth to the sun. The innovative orbit lets nature cool the telescope allowing the observatory to operate for around five and a half years using 360 liters of liquid helium, um, roughly four liters to a gallon. So you have 90 gallons of liquid helium to operate this instrument uh, for 5.5 uh, years. And there is where the life of the instrument will end with, this, with these instruments because there's no way to get into space and refuel the Spitzer, uh, unlike the Hubble, which is in an orbit around the Earth, so you could go visit it. You, we really can't visit the Spitzer. Uh, is there any questions, Mary, at this point? Okay, I don't hear of any, okay. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. Just, just a minute. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, Frank asked, with space being so cold, why was a cryo medium required? Um, one of the number of possibilities. First of all, it will get heated from the sun. It has instruments that are operating uh, so that it will heat up the, uh, the telescope. Um, and so their designs was effectively just to keep uh, it to cool the um, the energy that was coming from its instrumentation. That's what I'm um, gathering. Uh, but remember, uh, the the uh, telescope will absorb energy from the sun. So just like the Earth is sitting in space, our our temperature is not zero degrees. It's much above that. So and the reason being, we're getting. Uh, energy from the sun, which is heating us, uh, the Spitzer will have that same problem, uh, that it would be heated from the sun, plus its own instruments uh, would um, generate heat. Uh, and so you have to cool things down in order to get the most sensitivity. Uh, the, the, the issue is getting it, the instruments as sensitive as possible because you want to detect objects in space that are, as, um, that are generating very little light that are very cold, uh, you know, 30 degrees above absolute zero, 10 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, and so this allows us to do that by, um, by keeping it as cold as possible. Okay, hopefully that answered the question. Uh, if there's more, we can, I'll come back to that. By the way, just to let you know that the Spitzer um, use with its design of making sure that it reflected any light from the sun, most of the light from the sun as possible and running things more efficiently. It, as it's used 360 liters that, and it lasted five and a half years, the, uh, the iris, which um, used 520 liters and it only lasts 
10 months. So it was quite an improvement in, in efficiency of, of needing to be cooled for that period of time. Um, the next major thing in all um, telescopes and all uh, space satellites are using the technique of store and dump telemetry. And that is, instead of continually broadcasting the information that the object collects and uses up bandwidth and energy uh, and makes it uh, harder for multiple instruments to be in space and getting information, what the, uh, the store and dump is that the uh, telescope um, restores all its pictures and then at a certain period of time gets a signal that says, okay, send me all this information uh, and, and, then, uh, and then once I get it all, you, you can turn off your transmitters for a while. And so Spitzer's high gain antenna is fixed to a point in a single direction. So the <clears throat> observatory interrupts its scientific program twice a day to repoint the antenna towards the earth and downlink of all its data. And it uses, uh, and I, I think I gave a talk about this, um, but the average data link is 85 kilobits per second. You go, wow, that's not very fast. Uh, but it allows uh, the transmission of data with uh, much lower power transmitters than needed at high bit rates. Um, and there is a eight gigabit onboard data storage, which prevents data being overwritten before it can be downlinked to the sky. And it uses the um, NASA's deep space network. So by store and dump, uh, everybody gets a time slot. And so they, they, uh, each satellite can say, okay, I need this information. And you have, you know, this 15 minute, this half hour time slot for us to get your information. And so you, you're sharing resources. You also do not have to have your transmitter on 24 seven, which takes a lot of power. Uh, and, and then all, and there, and also you can, since everyone's not transmitting at once, the, the link is uh, cleaner and, uh, and your data uh, error rate is much less. Uh, program management, which to me, this is a no brainer. Um, in previous flight development programs, the design and requirements of the mission were completed first and then contractors were brought on to bid on the development. So someone came up and said, okay, this is what we wanna build. I wanna build a 50 story building uh, with these many bedrooms and this many kitchens and bathrooms. What they came up with is said, in order to constrain costs, let's come up with a concept of what this telescope is gonna do, what our ideas are and see if we can come back with feedback from both the engineers and the contractors to keep the cost maintained. Maybe you have some ideas that if we use this versus that, we get the same results, but it will be much less expensive. Uh, and part of the expense, by the way, is how much time it takes. Uh, the project team members included industrial contractors were solicited early enough to enable full participation in the preliminary designs. So they had a preliminary design. They didn't have the final design. Uh, and they said, okay, what can we do to get what we need in, in the shortest time and at the least cost? Um, and this is how they kept the cost down. Um, and everyone agreed to it. The entire Spitzer team worked closely together during design and development phases of the Spitzer. Okay. Uh, people who have built houses, what happens? That design of the house is done and then you go out for bid. Here they were trying to get people involved early on. Uh, and if you can get buy-in from everybody, and uh, it, it can lead, as this project showed, to uh, getting the project done quicker and cheaper. So the Spitzer consists of two main parts, the solar panels, which provide electrical power to the spacecraft and shield the cryogenic telescope assembly from the sun, and the spacecraft bus and octagon structure that houses the avionics and warm electronics parts of the scientific instruments. So as the question was asked, where does the heat come from? Well, we block most of the energy coming from the sun, but there's electronics on board that are running and that's generating heat. And in order to keep the instruments cold, you need liquid helium to do that. Uh, the telescope, the Spitzer telescope is a lightweight reflector of the Ritchie criterion design. Does that sound familiar folks? That's what we have with a mirror measuring 85 centimeters. Not that big though, not that big, okay, uh, 12 inches. 
It's not a very big telescope, uh, but it does its job. It weighs less than 50 kilograms, 110 pounds, and is designed to operate at extremely low temperatures. Liquid helium, by the way, as I said, cools at 4.2 degrees above absolute zero. The telescope is attached to the top of the cryostat, which keeps the scientific instruments very, very cold. So you get your most sensitivity from your, your detectors. Uh, the Spitzer's three scientific instruments, it has an infrared array camera, IRAC, an infrared uh, spectrograph, IRIS, and a multiband imaging photometer which is called MIPS, and I'll just mention each of them. So the infrared array camera is a general purpose camera that is used by observers for a wide range of astronomical research programs. Unlike normal cameras, which has a single detector array, it is sensitive to a wide range of different wavelengths of light. IRAC is a four channel camera, meaning that it has four different detectors, each measuring light at one particular wavelength. Now, actually, um, just to make a note, our, your typical camera, like in your uh, iPhone, uh, actually each pixel is three cameras, uh, each three detectors. It detects red, green, and blue light because that's what the primary colors are. And then it puts it together to give you your true color. So it detects light at, at the primary colors in each. And so each pixel has three detectors. Here, each pixel has four detectors. IRAC is the only one of Spitzer's instruments that will still function once liquid helium uh, uh, runs out. And so this is the camera that's been taking pictures since uh, after five years, 19, 2009, when the, um, liquid helium ran out, the other two, uh, the other instruments were, were not operational at this point. The infrared uh, spe spectrograph, it provides both high and low resolution spectroscopy at mid infrared wavelengths uh, from five to 40 microns. Uh, like a prism breaking up light into rainbow, the spectrograph takes the incoming infrared light from a distant object and breaks it up into a spectrum of, of infrared colors. And Spitzer ob observers have recently used this method to find water on a planet orbiting another star. So you, um, as in optical end, you break up light into colors and different uh, atoms and different molecules give off different colors of light. Uh, it also works in the infrared regime. And so if you can look at uh, the infrared spectrum of uh, uh, a chemical, you can actually tell what its composition is. The multiband imaging photometer, MIPS, uh, like IRAC, it is an imaging camera, but it detects light in the far infrared at wavelengths between 2470 and 160 microns. MIPS is also capable of a, a simple a, a spectroscope like IRIS. Uh, this is for the physicists or whatever in the audience. You can see um, in this picture what infrared sees, different colors of uh, temperatures of an object give off different amount of infrared light at, and the peak of that light happens at different wavelengths, okay? So you will not be tested on this at the end, uh, but this gives an idea that as the object gets colder, if you notice at 10,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, stars are at that temperature, uh, give off light and most of it is in the visible. Uh, if you look at an object at 1,000 degrees, um, a, a, a brown dwarf star, uh, it gives off light in mostly the infrared, uh, in the near infrared, and in the uh, longer wavelengths, an object at 100 degrees, um, a hot gas in space is at 100 degrees, that is, uh, in, gives off light mainly in the infrared regime. Now, I'm going to end with some pictures showing you what the results are from some of these cameras. Uh, here is the Crab Nebula from five observatories, okay? So this is, by the way, the Crab Nebula is uh, in 1054, there was a supernova explosion and the re remnants of that supernova explosion is the Crab Nebula. And when astronomers looked out where this supposedly took place, uh, by the way, it was documented by a number of Chinese uh, astronomers. And when they looked, this is what they found. But if you look at the bottom of this picture, it's colorized. Um, there, it, there is 
um, light coming from radio telescopes, light coming from the Spitzer infrared, light coming from optical from the um, Hubble, light coming from UV, which is um, the uh, Newton telescope, and X-ray light coming from the Chandra telescope. And we put that all together to get this gorgeous picture of, of the uh, of, of the Crab Nebula. Here's another picture of the Crab Nebula. And on the bottom of this one, it shows you what, the, what comes just from radio uh, telescopes. That's on the bottom left. Then you see in yellow, that is the light colorized coming from the Spitzer Space Telescope. The middle one is optical coming from the Hubble. Uh, and I believe the, and then the ultraviolet light colorized in blue comes uh, from uh, the ultraviolet telescope and from the uh, Chandra to X-ray telescope, it's in purple. And you put all these three together and you, you get this gorgeous full picture of the Crab Nebula, not just in optical light. Uh, these are the ending 12 beautiful photographs of, of the, that Spitzer took um, during its lifetime. I'm going to go over some of these and show you uh, how they put this together. Remember, we can't see infrared light, so they colorize it at different wavelengths in order to give us a true picture. So here's the Triangulum Nebula Spitzer three-color image, and on the bottom, notice that in blue is the, is the light and the uh, the intensity is how bright the blue is, and that is at, um, at the shortest uh, infrared wavelengths. Uh, the green is light at an, another different wavelength, uh, and the higher intensity, the brighter it would be in green. And then the red is at the longer wavelength, uh, and you, so you're seeing most of red light in this background with some green. Uh, and the more intense the light, the brighter the red, or the brighter the green or the brighter the uh, blue is depending on how much light is coming at each wavelength. And so this is how we colorize it and put it together. Uh, here's the Perseus molecular cloud. Uh, it, this is done in a single wavelength. Uh, so it's colorized to be red. Uh, and it's, it's, this is what the uh, temperature of that cloud looks like. The highest temperature is where the, it is the brightest and the low, coolest of the cloud is where it's the dullest. And you can see how far the cloud extends out in space in infrared, okay? Uh, in the optical range, we would we, we see very little of this. Uh, here's the jack-o'-lantern nebula in colorized with four colors um, in four different wavelengths. By the way, let me take a break for a second. Mary, are there any questions uh, at this point? Yes, Al, there are. Um... Fantastic. All right, one of the, is what colors would we see if we flew a spaceship right up to the one of the nebula you described? Which one, the jack-o'-lantern and one before? Um, doesn't say. Well, I'll go back to this one. This one, most likely you might not see anything in the visible light range because the cloud is pretty cool. Okay, we have two and, more And that's, oh, that's the advantage of the infrared that uh, there, if if something is is a uh, hundred degrees uh, above absolute zero, so minus three hundred and sixty degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, you it doesn't give off any visible light at all, and you would say there's nothing there. But if you look at it in infrared, you see something is there. Okay, all right. We have two two more questions. One is from Isabel. He says. You said that there are some objects in the same orbit than Earth, but drifting away from Earth. I think that, no, th no, yeah, the, I think that there's at a different speed. No, no. So there are um, there. There's a name for those, and it slips my mind. But there are satellites following the Earth orbit. We found them first around Jupiter. Um, the uh, there's there's objects that are following Jupiter as it rotates around the sun. And we've recently found an object that is in the same orbit as the earth. It's not moving away from the earth or moving towards the earth. It's in the same orbit and it's moving around with us. Okay. And um, okay. the other question is from Frank. Was the post helium 
Iraq only period anticipated or mission objectives pre-authored or did they have to think about how to best use the bonus period? Uh, I don't know, but my, my guess is if I was there, they knew they would run out of liquid helium um, and they, they have to be authorized periodically to continue um, planning on what to do with the instrument. And I have a feeling that the fact that at least the infrared camera was running, their feeling was that they would let it operate um, and, and um, continue to give data back and not shut down the instrument. Um, I, have, I have a feeling a number of things have gone awry in, uh, and, they, and things are not operating well, and maybe that's why they shut it off. But if you look at the Hubble, uh, the, the original plans for the Hubble was that they were going to send a satellite up to it and change its orbit so that it would crash into the ocean and be self-destructed. Uh, and as time went on, they decided, gee, we don't have to do that right away. We can, since we can get to the Hubble, when we had the space shuttle, unfortunately now we don't, we can get to the space shuttle, they would go and do a repair mission. And the last um, Hubble uh, servicing, uh, they put into place everything they could do, replaced everything they could replace so that they could keep the Hubble running as long as possible because they're figuring at this point was that nobody would visit it again until it was decommissioned and crashed into the ocean. Um, and I think that is the same way with, by the way, with the, with the, um, the rovers on Mars. You have a design window that you say that it will last a year, but if it remains operational, you try to get authorization to say, can we run it for a longer period of time? The camera works without liquid helium. Uh, the minimum that we wanted the mission to be was five and a half years, but it's still running. Can we get authorization to run it longer? because it's giving us good data. And I'm gathering that's what, what uh, NASA agreed to uh, and probably reauthorize it year after year. That's my guess, but I don't really have concrete data on, that, on, on anything else. They, th they seem to keep this in, uh, under the wraps. Okay, Al, thank you. Um, that's the last question we have there. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything else to- I have a couple more pictures and then we can- Sure. Okay. So here's the jack o' lantern, and this was done when colorized in four wavelengths. Um, again, the blue is the shorter wavelength, which is the higher energy um, infrared. So it's it's it would have to you would get blue if the th object was higher temperature. The lower the temperature, you would get more light at a shorter wavelength. And so the longest wavelength of the infrared, 24 uh, uh, microns, uh, is the uh, is it colorized to red. Uh, and the, the beauty of putting all this together, I mean, if someone showed you this, you say, oh, that looks like an optical picture, but it really is four colors of uh, infrared light, uh, each one uh, taken uh, and put together and coming up with a color because again, we can't see infrared. We can only see the intensity. Here's the jack-o'-lantern uh, at some other colors, okay. Um, here's the bubbles, bubbles everywhere, again, put together with four wavelengths, 3.6, 8.0, and 24 uh, microns of uh, infrared light. Uh, and for me, these pictures are gorgeous, but it shows you that there's a gas at, and you can work with what the temperature of this gas is. It's much below uh, a gas of a star, which is in multi-thousands degree temperature. This is in multi-hundred degree temperature. Okay, here's something famous. This is M81 uh, and infrared light. Uh, we will, I will, I have pictures of it showing you an infrared and invisible, and you can see the information that it gives you. So in infrared light, you see the uh, object and it's, and the uh, uh, bands coming out of the object, the uh, wings pretty st strong here. Uh, here it is in, uh, full infrared and you and it, you can see regions of uh, new stars being uh, that are uh, bright they're very bright stars that are they're in the bands of the uh, of the uh, 
galaxy. Uh, here it is just in uh, a single band of infrared showing you mainly the hot gases that are in the uh, in this uh, galaxy and the hot gases and that's where star formation is, is in the, the disk of the galaxy coming out in, in, in the bands, okay? There's no gas in, or very little gas that are not in, in, in these bands. And here is what it looks like um, in visible light. And in visible light, uh, blue light is at 440 nanometers and, and uh, Violet light is 656. So this is the picture that we're used to seeing of, of M81. Uh, but this is what it looks like uh, in infrared light. And you, you can see we get different information. It shows us some uh, where the temperature of the gases are hotter and gives us some different perspective of what's happening in, in this galaxy. Uh, and here is a, the combination of visible and infrared, all the information that it gives us. And you could see some of the hot gases that are coming out in the uh, bands of, the, of this uh, galaxy. Okay, and infrared light only. And here's Cepheus C and Cepheus B uh, in infrared. Okay, hot gases. There are some stars, but we're seeing the gases which are at much lower temperature than the temperature of the stars. So we would not see these when you look through uh, an ordinary telescope from, from Earth, uh, visible light. Uh, and here is it more in uh, shorter wavelength of infrared for looking at hotter gases. And that, that's some of the pictures. I could, there's thousands and thousands of pictures, but I'd like to thank you for coming. By the way, I had fun making this slide. And as I always leave, clear skies. And may the force be with you. And just to leave you, um, the, uh, a lot of the information is, is on the Spitzer uh, Caltech uh, EDU's website. Uh, massive amount of, of pictures and uh, that have been collected over the 16 years of, uh, of the existence of this telescope. I'm not sure what happens to the telescope. It's probably just being left there, probably shut down, um, or maybe somebody has a chance to get some more data out of it. Someone mentioned in the beginning of the talk here that they got some new pictures, but of, officially what I've read is that, you know, January 30th, it's supposedly that was the end of its mission. Anyway, thank you again, and I'm happy to take more questions. For me, this has been interesting to um, talk to everybody at a distance uh, in this new world of COVID-19. Okay. Okay, Al, we do have another uh, question. It's really, I think, more of a comment from Cliff. He says, nearly all the stars are blue. Makes sense. They are not, they are quite hot. Some right. are red. Are these brown dwarfs or possibly even planetary objects? Uh, no one, on, on the objects that we were, I was showing you were, were looking out at, uh, didn't comment on looking at uh, for extra planets. Uh, they were just, I think, looking at the um, gases that are surrounding uh, the areas. Look like more, that's what they were looking for. Um, they they did do some studies, and I didn't. The great question. Um, they did do some studies looking at extra planets with the Spitzer, but I didn't grab those pictures. There's just I didn't want us to be here all night, but I mean it's. Not like the Hubble, which unbelievable has you know so many more pictures, but there's quite a few pictures that that Spitzer has supplied us with, uh, and that has been uh, released to the general public. Uh, and there is some pictures that where they looked at extra planets, and as it, I mentioned, they actually were able to detect using the um, infrared spectrometer that one of the planets looked like it had water uh, in the atmosphere of the planet. Al, he says, Clip also says, I was looking at the background stars in the field. Oh, I, 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 no, I don't know. I haven't looked at them in detail in that end, but I'll, I'll go back and look at it. But it's, it, it's interesting. I don't know if, if anyone's looked at that. I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. But, but um, a typical planet would probably be much below 1,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, 
Okay. Um, where a star is, is like our sun is, is roughly 6,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, by the way, I can't translate it to Celsius, I mean, uh, Fahrenheit. <laughs> Uh, my mind doesn't handle that anymore. Um, and, but uh, the, uh, the Earth is roughly 321 degrees uh, Kelvin ab above absolute zero. So that's a good comparison. So you're looking at an object that's a couple hundred degrees above absolute zero, and that you would be able to see very nicely in an infrared camera. I'm not sure if any of those pictures were looking at that, but what we're finding is people are going back. There's a I'm not sure. Maybe it was Cliff who sent it out. Uh, the, there's a uh, there is they're they're releasing more of the pictures from Hubble where people can go look and see if they can see anything of interest in in in, in the you know thousands and thousands of pictures that were taken. So maybe there is something in there, but uh, I, I I don't know. I don't I can't answer that. Okay, Al. Thank you. Does anybody have any more questions in the Q and A? All right, then um, if not, I want, I want to thank you, Al. Just as a reminder, it's Dr. Al Gottlieb. He used to teach at UCC. Um, he um, is, are you still teaching at uh, Kane? Uh, I retired for the fourth time from Kane <laughs> last May. Um, and my new avocation is playing the French horn. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I want to thank you. And um, uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. And if um, anybody uh, wants to stay on, I will open this up for people to be able to see each other and talk. All right.